Hey everybody, today we are going to talk about intervals. Now, in my previous lessons, I keep using vocabulary like put the flat 13 on this, the flat 9, the 11, the sharp 11. And uh, I know that a lot of you guys have no clue what the fuck I'm talking about because you write me that you have no clue. So we're going to break down uh, what intervals are and how to play them. And actually making this video made me realize that some of this shit isn't as obvious as you'd think. So stick around. You're going to enjoy this. Uh, the first thing is how to play a unison. Now, you can't really play a unison on the same string. That would be just repeating the note, right? So you'd have to do it on the next one. So let's say I'm playing a C. That's how I do it. Now, on the guitar, you would have to compensate when you get to the G and B string, meaning that shape is going to repeat. But when I get here, I'm going to have to shrink my range by a fret and then expand it again between the B and E. So here, I just have one shape for unisons because anything else is going to be so wide from this G to this G that unless I'm a tapper, it doesn't matter and tappers aren't human beings, so let's be real. Okay, next shape, we have flat twos. Two ways to play flat twos. I have this way, obviously, and then on the next string, right? Now here, it shrinks and then expands again. So as chords, here are my flat twos. Let's talk about natural twos. You can play them on the same string, obviously. Uh, that's possible and easy. And on the next string, I have two shapes. The one from most of the strings and the one from just the G to the B. One, and then this. Now here we already get some useful stuff. When I play, let's say, an A minor 11, it has that natural two on top. It's a part of the chord structure. Something to think about. Flatted thirds, right? On the same string, gonna be the same everywhere, obviously. That's when it's on the same string, it's always the same. And then flatted thirds on an adjacent string. It's gonna look like this shape. But when I get to the G and B string, it shrinks, opens up again. So you can pretty much see the principle that's happening right now, just from me going through it. Next one, major thirds. I can play them on two strings. to compensate between the G and B. With thirds, a new door kind of opens up. Now, when I'm playing thirds on three strings on the span of between, let's say, the E and D, A and G, D and B and G and E, I get these shapes. Now, on the E, they're very stretchy, right? I get this, too intense, really, unless you're really crazy. But once it kind of fans down from the D and the B, and the G and E, I start getting these shapes for a third. And that starts allowing for some interesting things. And you start seeing some players starting to use those kind of ways of spacing a third and throwing another note in the middle, which really allows you to play these tetrachord kind of shapes that are just kind of one, two, three in a scale played as a chord, right? Like Do, Re, Mi type shapes. Cool. Next shape, a fourth. Here's a fourth on one string. A lot of Holdsworth licks have that. Those kind of cool shapes. A cross. Just flatten your finger. You got a fourth, except for the G and B string. Now, across two strings, right? It gets a little bit tighter, a little bit easier to play. You have this. And this is already useful. Right? Pentatonic shapes could be played this way. Uh, between the D and the G string, this is already manageable. You have shapes, a lot of songs use those kind of things. Now, a fourth between the D and G and a fourth between the G and E. Already tightens up a little bit, so it's okay. Let's talk about sharp fours or flat fives. Same location, different name. You got this. Now, on one string, this is challenging, but still possible for the big-handed community. Now, across two strings, very comfy. And then you compensate for the B string from the G. So, that interval. 
now across three strings from the E to the D. You get this shape. You can really play, let's say, a closed position diminished chord. Right? Now, from the D to the G, it shrinks to be very comfortable. Same from the G to the E. So you got these shapes now. Let's talk about perfect fifths, power chords. So on one string, this is sort of my limit, right? Sort of a little bit over my limit, but still on the verge of possible. Now, across two strings, we all know power chords. You gotta compensate from the G to the B. When you play them across three strings, this is already very comfortable. You have this shape, this shape, and now you have these two. A lot of our basic chords are based on this, right? A major chord, one, three, five, one flat, three, five, right? Have these as the outline. Flatted six, you have two shapes for the flatted six. I got the adjacent ones here and then I got the shape over three strings I have these two and these two first inversion major chords have that as the outline right you got those flat sixes now let's talk about major sixes on two adjacent strings between the G and B it's already real stretchy Right? And I see that a lot of guitar players just are not aware that this is a major six, too. So it's something to practice. Now, across a couple strings, here's a major six, major six, major six, major six. Cool. Now, let's start to see the major six across four strings. How would that look? So if this is from D to this B, I'm gonna have to see it here. That's really stretchy. I don't actually think of any chords that really have that shape, but as I move it to the next string, I can shrink it a little bit. Now that sound, right? You see some crazy guitar players that are really Holdsworthian in spirit that do a lot of those kind of shapes. Right, you start having this be the framework across four strings. So that's something to keep in mind. The next one's flatted sevens. I got obviously the adjacent shape. Between the G and B, it's stretchy. Then I have the three string shape. Very comfy. All of your typical minor seven chords will have that shape in them, obviously. And you can space this one across four strings and sounds and looks pretty good. You got this, it's still pretty wide. But it shrinks when you start it on the A and on the D. And here it's already pretty manageable. You got these chords, which are more pianistic in nature. Closed position seven chords that has a flatted seven on top so you can use that next one we have major sevens so major sevens i'm no longer going to even attempt on the next string i'm going to start that shape two strings away so here are my major seven shapes i have one two three four Now, if I space it out to be four strings away, I get these shapes. Let's start with D as a root, just so it's less intense on the hands. So I have this, and I can play my major sevens right framed inside it. Then I have these, which are much more comfy. Right, nice sound, but here's my major seven, this one, right? So that's easier to see. Now we get to the octave. There are really two ways to play an octave. You can use the West way, which are on 
spaced on three strings, or you can space them on four strings. You can go. Next one, flat and nine. It's sort of like a flat two plus an octave. So you can space them out two strings away, meaning from E to D, etc. That gives you less of an opportunity to build a nice jazz chord because you only have one note in the middle. When you space out the flat nine on the span of four strings, it's an opportunity to throw in, let's say, the third and the flat at seventh and give you some nice sound. So this A7 flat nine to a D minor. This D7 flat nine to a G minor. This G7 flat nine C minor, right? In jazz, when you have that flat nine distance, you can fill it up with a dominant chord. A lot of things you can do, but that's one of them. Cool, but you have to be able to see that interval. Okay, now let's talk about natural nines. So here's a natural nine. If you're sting, right? That's how they play all that kind of stuff. So right there, a little wider on the top two strings. If I put that nine spanned on four strings, I have the opportunity to do what I did with the flat nine. Nice shapes. I can do it with minor, with major, with whatever, but remember that this is the shape. Let's try to span that nine across five strings. Now notice that when you're spanning things on five strings, you don't compensate, meaning a ninth here is a ninth here, right? You're, you have defeated that weird thing that's happened with the tuning of the guitar with the B string across five strings. So you can throw in big chords, let's say, that have a nine on top, right? sounds if you understand how to space it out on the guitar let's talk about the next interval a minor tenth or a sharp nine depending how you're thinking about it so if I'm spacing it on three strings it's sort of stretchy but you see a lot of bass lines that have that right or usually people slide into it uh, on the next couple of strings, it's real stretchy, right? But if you space it out on four strings, it's super comfortable, right? You have this, you have this, and this. And that's sort of the external shell if you're using it as a sharp nine and putting a dominant chord in the middle of a Hendrix chord. A flatted tenth across five strings. You got this, and you got this, right? To play, you can play many voicings that have that minor third on top and really play a full kind of sound, right? Just a D minor or a G minor played like this, maybe, or Holdsworthy in type of chords will have those kind of spacings in them. Next one, a tenth. We all know uh, Blackbird, right, all these minor and major tenths. Uh, so a tenth, I would really not think about a tenth across three strings anymore. To me, it's a little bit too wide, especially when I get here. I never use those kind of shapes, but I do use it all the time here across four strings. So one, two, three. Just thinking about major sevens, maybe. So the shape for a tenth across five strings. We got this one, and we got this one. To me, that's already looking like a cowboy chord, right? A G shape and a C shape. We'll have that. We all know that shape, right? Of a tenth. Now let's talk about an 11th. An 11th is a fourth plus an octave. The first place I would see it would be spaced across four strings. So here's one, two, and 
three. In the case of an eleventh, you can play sus chords with them. Do many things, but the important thing is to understand the space, right? So one. Across five string, you get this shape. So the shape for a minor eleven, you get this. Lots of chords live there. The next shape, you have a sharp 11, four plus an octave. So the first place I really see that is here, right? Pretty, it's starting to get stretchy, but you see it. Like for a Lydian sound, you can really use. Or this. Or this. that thing. It's also a minor seven flat five sound, right? But the more useful place to put it is five strings away right there and there. And then you really have those shells for minor seven flat fives, dominant sharp elevens, major seven sharp elevens. They're all right there. On the next string, Whatever you need, diminished, we'll have that. This next one is called a 12, which is really a fifth and an octave. I don't really ever hear anybody call it a 12. Like That doesn't really ring a bell for me. And uh, I guess maybe theoretically that's what it's called, but in practice, never heard it. But anyway, here's the shape across four strings, which could be useful for some things, I guess, right? You see that occasionally, but mostly you see it spaced across five strings. And that's very useful, obviously. Major chords, minor chords, anything has a fifth on top. You, you can really use that. Uh, next one, we have flat 13s, which are just like sit flat sixes plus an octave. Uh, I really don't see flat sixes here even though you can, especially on these two, it just gets a little stretchy, but across five strings, it's a very, very useful way of seeing it, like any sort of dominant chord with a flat six on top. You can really start seeing that. You can space a flat six or start to across six strings and I, I saw some people do it. I know Holdsworth has things like that. So it's possible, very stretchy. Not everybody has the reach for that one. Next one, sixes plus an octave, thirteens. There are really two ways you can play them. Across five strings, you have these shapes. And just a thirteen chord. Right, those. Minor 13. But you can also start voicing that 13th across six strings and really get some nice voicings, right? Right? All right, let's talk about 14s or flat 14s or flat 7s. Nobody ever says flat 14. I never heard it in my life. Uh, but flatted 7s plus an octave. Now, there really are only two ways to space this out. Five strings, right? We got this. And if you your dominant chords sit in here, your minor 7s, and obviously on the next set of strings. But you can also get these kind of voicings now. And then we have major sevens plus octaves, which look like this. Or across five strings. Or across six strings, we have this. Cool. Now the two octave shapes and everything above that is really not spaced very well. Across five strings, we're just using of six strings to get those intervals. There's no other choice. 
And those are super useful, the very compound intervals on the guitar, because in jazz, you, you get to put your, your tension so far away from the chord. So let's just take an A dominant with a flat nine, which is not really a flat nine, it's a flat 16, I guess, 16? I don't know, never heard of it. Uh, but yeah, it's like another octave above it. So right here, here's your nine plus that octave. Here's your sharp nine. Here's your third. Right? Here's your sus. Here's your sharp eleven. Here's your fifth. And you're done. Right? There's no more unless you're a tapper. And we already said what we think about those. All right. Subscribe to this. Like it. Ring the bell. Leave a comment. See you next time. There's a ton of content. Be sure to check out everything and join our Patreon. Bye-bye.